morning. I'm going to be opening up to Mark chapter 1. We're going to mostly be there. We'll jump around just a little bit. A couple weeks ago, we started looking at a Bible study that you could very easily study with someone as, a, as an evangelistic effort. Uh, just simply telling the story of who Jesus was. We looked at, <clears throat> two weeks ago, Jesus the Lord and noticed a couple of things of who Jesus was as Lord, the master of storms and disease and death and sickness and demons. There we go. Those were not in order. You have to go back and watch it to get in order. This week we're going to look at Jesus the man. Now, while we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at the, the crucifixion scene, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time studying about the purpose of that crucifixion. Uh, that would be in the next lesson a little bit of the salvation, the good and the bad, the verses not obeying and obeying. That's next week's. This week, the focus is going to be on Jesus as a human being. Jesus the Lord, the Son of God, God incarnate. The focus now is Jesus, physical flesh, physical man, 100% man, just as he is 100% God. And to start off, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, might seem kind of a one of those verses that you just sort of read at the beginning of... Uh, a study of this section of scripture maybe as Jesus is getting ready to start his ministry but what I want to draw our attention to is in the morning having risen a long while before daylight this is verse 35 he went out departed to a solitary place and there he prayed I'm not gonna say that you have to wake up super early before the Sun gets up and go by yourself and pray the point here is when you think about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, going and praying, that kind of makes me scratch my head a little bit. Jesus is God. He's one of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, we have God the Son. Had the need, had the urgent need, felt this pressing desire to wake up first thing in the morning, go off by himself, and pray to God the Father. Jesus needed to do that. So do we. Jesus was just as much a man as we were. He needed just as much God the Father's help as we do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, one of those really short passages of Scripture that, uh, that we can memorize really easy. Pray without ceasing. Jesus needed to pray. We need to pray. If Jesus felt this, and we're going to notice this in a little bit later on, but if Jesus felt this desire, this deep need to be close to the Father in prayer, then how much more should we need to feel that need? How much more should we go to the Father in prayer and spend time with Him? Let's go flip over to chapter 3 now. Again in Mark. And the reason we're looking at Mark, and there's other Gospels, Luke gives a lot of details of the life of Christ. Some very specific details. Mark is one of those, it's a little bit of a shorter book. There's not as many details, but he jumps right in to where Jesus starts his life and his ministry. And we see here in chapter 3 a scene that is difficult for a number of reasons. As Jesus, the man, uh, part of being human is not just experiencing joy, but experiencing the difficulties. There was a lot of people around the first century that believed that Jesus wasn't really ever a man, that he never really was fully human, that that would take away something from him being God. But when we notice some of these little details, we realize that Jesus was a man he experienced difficulties just the way we experience difficulties. He goes here, again, this is, this is kind of the beginning 
of his ministry here in verse 20, Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then the multitudes came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said, he's out of his mind. And then skipping down a couple of chapters later in chapter 6, we're going to come back to chapter 3 uh, and, and notice a couple of things in, in connection with these two passages. Verse 1, chapter 6. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is it that this that is given to him? That such mighty works are performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Simon? And they're not his sisters here with us. So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives in his own house. He could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about in the villages in the circuit teaching. Jesus knows what it's like to have your family. He knows what it's like to have your friends turn on you. There's many in the world today, if they were to, and we talked a little bit about this in, in the men's Bible class this morning, there's many in the world today that that accepting Christ, accepting that life of a Christian, means turning your back on your family. Or rather, having your family turn their backs to you. Jesus knows what it's like to have the people that you grew up knowing, the people that you grew up loving, the people that you grew up respecting, the people that helped raise you, the leaders in the community in Nazareth, the leaders of the synagogue, his family, his, the people that he grew up next door to, these are the people here that we're reading about. These are the people here that he went back and he starts preaching to them. He starts teaching. And it says there that he, he didn't perform or he couldn't perform. There's different versions that read it a little bit differently. It says in verse 5, now he could do no mighty works there. It's not that, it's not that the, the power of God couldn't be performed on those people that they were unbelievers. They chose to turn their backs on him not because of the things that he was teaching were wrong. It's not because he was, he was being boastful or, or proud or arrogant. It was that they just didn't want to believe that Jesus, Mary's son, the carpenter, really? His brothers are here. We watched him grow up. Why, why would we listen to him? He's nobody special. Jesus knows what that feels like. Jesus put God's will ahead of appeasing or keeping those old family friends. Jesus put God's will ahead of those people that he grew up knowing and loving because he knew that God's will was the only will that was going to be done. Jesus knows that pain. Hebrews chapter 4 Keep your finger in Mark. We're going to come back there. Talking about a, a great high priest compared to the high priest in the old days, in the Old Testament. And now we have a better high priest. That's the context of this passage here. It says, seeing then that we have, in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession." For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We can talk about theology and, and, and debating whether or not Jesus uh, you know, really was a man, or was he really God, or was he capable of sinning. Or uh, Yeah, he was a man. He was tempted in all points. 
Could he have, on that day when he was tempted in the wilderness, to turn the stones to bread? Could he have fallen and worshipped the devil and received all the kingdoms of the earth? Could he have come down off the cross? Could he have called 10,000 angels? I think the very nature of temptation means yes, he could have. He was tempted. What is temptation? But our own lusts, our own desire. And when we give in and we're drawn away, then we sin. Jesus was tempted. He desired. I can't imagine hanging on a cross and not wanting to get down. I can't imagine being beaten with a whip and then spit on and slapped around not wanting to call 10,000 angels if it was in my power. Jesus was tempted in all points. Going back now to Mark chapter 14 again. Going we'll back to Mark, and now we're going to spend the next part of the lesson mostly in these next few chapters in Mark. And while there are other examples, as I mentioned, Luke, uh, Matthew, gives some pretty gory accounts of this crucifixion scene. Mark's is really kind of tame compared to those. There's not as many gory details uh, of the, the whippings and the scourgings. It's more, a, more of a personal account almost. More of a, uh, an emotional account of where Jesus was emotionally is the focus. We see him here in chapter 14. And he says, wherever he goes and stay, say, uh, says to the master of the house, I'm not in the right place. No, verse 18, there we go. I was reading in the wrong place. Verse 18, now, as they sat and ate, Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one by one, is it I? And another, is it I? As, they, as Jesus says this, they're coming up to him privately. Maybe whispering in his ear. Hey, it's not me, is it? I'm not going to be the one to betray you. And he answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to him to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. As Jesus is eating this last meal, the last Passover, after he institutes the Lord's Supper, he's sitting there knowing who is going to betray him. He knows that it's going to happen. And he sits there and he eats. And then going down to verse 32, as he is there in the garden, and I want you to picture the scene. And it's difficult to put ourselves in, that, in those shoes, knowing what was getting ready to happen. Knowing that he was going to, at that very moment, be, be betrayed. Knowing that after Judas comes, that he was going to be let off and people were going to lie about him. And he was going to be tortured and then executed. It's difficult to put ourselves in that situation. But try to think about what maybe your mental state would be. Maybe it could be compared to someone who is going into combat. A police officer going into a hostile situation maybe. Knowing that something terrible could happen. And Jesus is there knowing what was going to happen and how did he spend his time. That kind of, kind of a fun question to play sometimes. Uh, you know, what if? Or what would you rather do? Or, or if you were on a desert island, what would you have with you? Or if you knew that tomorrow was going to be your last day, what would you do? What would you spend your time doing? Jesus in his last hours on earth. Spend his time in fellowship with his disciples and in prayer to the Heavenly Father. They came to Gethsemane in verse 32. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled 
and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. And then he went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. There's a couple of things there that kind of help us wrap our mind around how Jesus was feeling right there. Deeply distressed in verse 32. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever felt like it would be better if life were just over? That's how Jesus is feeling right there. Deeply distressed, even to the point of death. His, his soul was so sorrowful that he felt like he was going to just die. And he asked his friends, his three best friends, hey, come a little bit further with me. I want you to just be here while I struggle, while I ask the Father if this cup could pass, ask if this hour would pass away. His friends couldn't even stay awake. He goes back to him and he finds them all asleep. Stay and watch a little bit longer with me. Wake up. I need your help. He goes and prays some more and comes back, finds them all asleep again. They couldn't even stay awake. They didn't get it. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't understand. Jesus was there surrounded by friends and they had no idea what he was really going through. He told them, I am sorrowful even to death. I am deeply distressed. There are some things that you don't really understand until you go through it. There are some things that other people just won't get. It doesn't matter how many kinds of words that you use to describe how you're feeling. There's just sometimes when people are not going to get it. Jesus is here with his three best friends about to die a very painful death. He's told them about it. He told them before they went to Jerusalem what was going to happen. Well, we're going to go die. And Peter says, well, all right. Well, if he's going to die in Jerusalem, let's go with him. And Peter clearly didn't get it. <coughs> We're going to see that in just a minute. Fell to the ground and prayed. That word that he uses there, Abba Father, that's kind of a controversial word that Jesus used for God the Father. The Jews had a special word that uh, in, in later uh, centuries they wouldn't even say. We've lost the the way to say it, that, that Yahweh. When you see your, in your Bible the capital letter, Lord. We've kind of lost that to, to the years because they stopped saying it. It was the only time they would, they would use that word is in connection with God, the Father, the great I Am. But this Abba, that's not exactly the same. But that's more of a personal what a Jewish boy would call his father. Daddy. Abba, Father, please let this pass. Verse 43 through 50. And immediately, while he was still speaking, this was right after he comes back and finds his friends asleep and says, well, let's get up. My betrayer is at hand. Let's go. Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given a signal, saying, Whoever I kiss is the one, seize him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him away. And then one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? These, were, these weren't just a rabble of, of 
rioters. This wasn't just a mob of men who had swords and clubs. These were men who were the temple guards sent there by the high priest and the scribes and the elders. And he says, what, you come out here to take me away like I'm a common criminal? Like I'm going to resist arrest? I was with you, verse 49, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you, did not, you didn't seize me. But the scripture must be fulfilled. Anytime Jesus is there preaching in the, that whole week, they had been plotting and it was like they just couldn't take him. There was other times when, when they would go out to throw Jesus, I'm thinking they were going to throw him over a cliff. And Jesus turned and just sort of walked away. Walked in the midst of them and departed. There was numerous times that they could have taken him away. He was there in the temple. Why didn't they seize him? They come out at night so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And then look at verse 50. Maybe one of the saddest verses. Then they all forsook him and they fled. Those same people that Jesus had preached with, those same people that he had called out from their occupation and had followed him around and gone out to preach the word with him and, and had performed miracles through the power of God and, and had seen the miracles that Jesus could perform and, and knew intimately Jesus and spent nights on the beaches and in the boats and were saved from storms. The same people that said, all right, if Jesus is going to die, let's go with him. Peter went armed. He thought that, all right, this is it. Here comes the insurrection. We're going to throw out the Romans. And then we're going to reestablish the throne of David. And so he had that sword there and cut somebody's ear off that night. He didn't get it. Peter was willing to go and fight and die in a battle. But he was not willing to follow the Savior to die the death of a common criminal. Jesus felt that betrayal. He knows what it's like to be surrounded by people that you know and love and hug and kiss and say, I love you, right before they betray you. Right before they lie about you. Verse 55, as he's standing there before the people who have the power over life and death, it says, Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Verse 56, For many fought more false witness against him, but their testimony didn't agree. And then later on it says there were some that said that he said that he would destroy this temple that was built with hands in three days and rebuild it again with hands in three days. But even their testimonies didn't even line up. They were lying about him. They were saying this and that and the other, but it wasn't possible because it wasn't, the lies weren't lining up. Jesus knows what it's like to have people gossip and lie and make you look bad. Jesus felt that. Verse 56, chapter 14. Then some begin to spit on him. And to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, prophecy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. It's another way of saying they slapped him. They put this robe on him. After they beat him within an inch of his life, his back is shredded. And they put this crown of thorns on him. They spit on him. They slap him. After blindfolding him and say, hey, who just hit you? If you're, if you're the son of God, if you're a prophet, if you're the king, well, why don't you, you know, you could do all these things. So tell, tell us who, who just hit you. Tell us who just spit on you. Verse 66 through 72. We're not going to read this in its entirety. But we see Peter here. Warming his hands by the devil's fire. Somebody says, hey, you were with Jesus, weren't you? No, not me. <clears throat> and a little bit later on, a girl says, yeah, you, you were with him. No, it wasn't me. Yeah, well, your accent kind of gives you away. I think you were. They ask him, 
And he says, he begins to, to cuss at him, to swear. And I said, what in me? I never knew this guy. And then he hears the rooster crowing. And Luke tells us in chapter 2, verse, uh, ch chapter 66, verse 61. At that time when the rooster crows and Peter starts to remember that Jesus was in with his line of sight. And Jesus looks over at Peter and Peter remembers what Jesus told him. That he would deny knowing him. Peter, who was Jesus' best friend, left him in the garden. Went there to sort of be close to see what would happen. And then when asked, hey, you know Jesus, weren't you one of his buddies? He lies. No, I no. And it wasn't until he heard the rooster crowing and remembered what Jesus would say. And then, can you imagine that eye contact? Can you imagine that feeling? Knowing that I just lied about knowing my very best friend. Whom I confess to being the son of God. Can you imagine that feeling of physically seeing the son of God look at you? Right before he was getting ready to be led away. And you remembering, he told me I would do this. And I got so angry at him that I said, no, won't, not me. I won't do it. I'm not going to betray you. I will follow you to death, Jesus. Chapter 15, verse 6 through 15. We see Jesus here before Pilate. And this scene it isn't as detailed as what it was with uh, in, in Luke and Matthew. But what I want us to focus on is the scene where Pilate is trying every which way to get out of crucifying Jesus. He doesn't think that Jesus should be crucified. He doesn't believe that Jesus did anything wrong. And he's trying to figure out a way that, to make it okay. So where he can make the Jews happy and not kill an innocent man. And so he sort of puts this thing to the Jews. Hey, well, this time of year I usually let somebody go to you. So here, why don't we do this? And he, he finds a really nasty kind of guy. Barabbas. Uh, a rebel murderer. <coughs> and nobody liked. And Jesus. And he says... Which one do you want? Jesus knows what it's like to have Barabbas chosen instead of him. Pilate had it within his power. He was a coward. Pilate allowed a known murderer to go free. While he sent the Son of God, an innocent man, to be crucified. Can you imagine what that felt like for Jesus? Verse 17 through 20, he knows what, it like, what it's like to be abused. I've already mentioned this a little bit. Having been blindfolded and beaten. Had that crown shoved on his head and then hit in the head with sticks. Verse 34, one of those few things that we have recorded that Jesus said from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what it feels like, not only to have his friends desert him, have his friend betray him with a kiss, have his best friend deny knowing him, but he knows what it feels like to even feel as though God, the Father, has left him. We could study whether or not that actually happened, whether God actually abandoned Jesus on the cross. Regardless if God did that or not, Jesus felt like it happened. He felt all alone up on the cross. And finally, in verse 37... Jesus knows the sting of death. He cried with a loud voice and breathed his last. Jesus knows that feeling of death. He knows that feeling of pain. He knows that feeling of, of being deserted and abandoned and abused. 
Jesus knows those things because he felt those things. The high priest in the Old Testament was selected and was appointed and kept these rules and, and regulations and was God's high priest on earth. And Hebrews tells us that we have an even better high priest. Because it's not that we have a God that doesn't understand. It's not that we have a God that put us here and doesn't feel the pain that we feel. We have a God that knows the pain and sorrow of being human. We have a God that knows the struggles of temptation. A little bit of good news, though. Mark chapter 16, verses 5 and 6. And entering the tomb... They saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen and is not here. See the place where they laid him? Jesus suffered as a man, but when he rose, he was given all authority over heaven and earth. And he left a message that is still of the utmost importance for us today. Because, you see, it's not enough just to know the story of Jesus. It's not enough to, to read the Bible and to, to know that, that somebody lived in these, these, these examples of him walking on the water and turning water to wine and healing people and bringing people back from the dead. Knowing that he died on the cross, it requires action, continual action. It's not enough just to believe it and then move on with your life, but to do something about it. He says, one of the last things he says to his, his apostles, his disciples, verse 15 and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It's our responsibility. Not just to know who Jesus was, but it is our responsibility to teach others who Jesus was. Because if we don't, they can't believe and they'll be condemned. Jesus' life and death and resurrection are as just as important today as it was when it happened. Are you telling the world about the gospel of Christ? Are you telling the world that Jesus lived like we lived, died like we'll die, and we can raise again like his resurrection if we believe and are baptized. The gospel is always open. The water is ready. If you want to be a part of his church and have your sins washed away, won't you come as we stand and sing?